and we are live. Good afternoon, and welcome to our conversation of understanding panel on rethinking African American history at Southern Illinois University. In honor of Black History Month, we are engaging in this bold and courageous conversation because it's an imperative that we tell our story, speak the truth about our lived experiences, and do justice by offering a counter narrative. During this moment in history, we are witnessing the refining of white supremacy in the form of widespread propaganda. There was a concerted effort to silence the full truth about America and our collective voice. According to the American Library Association Office for Intellectual Freedom, more than 273 books were banned in 2020, with increasing demands to remove books that address racism and racial justice, specifically the stories of Black, Indigenous, and people of color. The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison, Mouth by Art Spiegelman, Stamp from the Beginning by Ember Kendi, The 1619 Project by 2020 Pulitzer Prize winner Nicole Hannah-Jones, Native American and the Question of Genocide by Alex Alvarez, The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas, all banned. There is a persistent desire to maintain an inaccurate and incomplete narrative about America, to omit the horrors of slavery, the destruction of Native American lives, the genocide of European Jews. The banning of books will prove to be another failed scheme in the evolution of white supremacy. We will not be silenced or erased. We will continue to be seen, heard, and exercise our full humanity. The Southern Illinois University schools value intellectual freedom and critical thinking. Today, we have guided scholars to tell an unvarnished tale. I am pleased to have a panel of experts who will speak eloquently about our persistence, resilience, and place in SIU history. Please join me in welcoming Reverend Dr. Father Brown as our panelist and moderator, Dr. Carl Flowers, Dr. Anthony Cheeseboro, Dr. Erlene Patterson, and Dr. Timothy Staples. We are also very pleased to have our system office president join us today as he has for all of our conversations of understanding, Dr. Dan Mahoney. And I also want to leave, as I realize I didn't introduce myself, uh, Dr. Sheila Caldwell, serving as Vice President for Anti-Racism, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Again, we thank you for joining us today as participants and panelist members, and we look forward to hearing from you today as well. And now we'll turn it over to our esteemed Dr. Father Brown. Thank you for serving again as our moderator. Thank you, Dr. Caldwell, and I appreciate the ring shout of women dancers behind you because the ring shout is where we're going to be, where we all move in a circle to move to a higher plane of understanding. I am Joseph Brown. I have been at Southern Illinois University since 1997, serving 16 years as chair or director of the Black Studies program here. And while I have been doing that, I have been doing a host of other things around the country and in the community, most especially from 2014 to 2020 as chair of the East St. Louis 1917 Race Riot Commission honoring the centennial of that race massacre. And uh, SIU is kind of in my bones also. That's who I am. And now I'm going to ask Dr. Erlene Patterson to introduce herself. Well, good afternoon. I am Erlene Patterson and I serve as associate Vice Chancellor for Student Opportunities, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. Um, primary responsibilities include uh, Director of SOAR, which is a support center, uh, an academic advising unit for uh, over 600 students. And we provide um, the structural transition support to first year uh, and some second year students. Dr. Dr. Carl Flowers, please let us know something about you. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you for 
for the opportunity to uh, to actually uh, join you this afternoon. Uh, I'm a um, 1993 RHD recipient from Southern, Southern Illinois University. I uh, first joined SIU in 1987 as a counselor at the Evaluation and a Developmental Center, a uh, program funded through the uh, College of Education and the Rehabilitation Institute to uh, to like serve persons with uh, physical and mental disabilities. I joined the uh, faculty of the Re of the Rehabilitation Institute in uh, in uh, two thousand one. Was uh, tenured in in, in uh, two thousand six as an associate professor and 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 then and then promoted to full professor in, in, in 2009. I was uh, named a director of the Rehabilitation Institute in 2010. That's where I served until my retirement in 2018. While at the university, I secured funding from the, from the Department of Education to support students seeking masters and, and, and PhDs and and uh, counseling and administration. I'm a certified rehabilitation counselor, a licensed, licensed a clinical professional counselor, and I serve as a mentor for uh, students at uh, Langston University a Research Academy. Um, I could uh, go on for another five minutes, but I was told I only have two, so I'll <laughs> stop right there. <laughs> and Dr. Flowers, your resume is a blessing to all of us. Now, Dr. Anthony Cheeseboro, say something. Uh, well, uh, I'm an associate professor of history at SIUE. I've been at SIUE uh, since 96. Prior to that, I was at uh, Murray State in Kentucky. Um, my original training was in uh, Northeast Africa. I worked in uh, what nowadays is the Republic of Sudan. Uh, I've been involved in programs in Nigeria and South Africa. Uh, really, uh, for the last 20 or so years, you know, basically uh, since, since my kids got big, I've, I've, I've worked primarily in American history. And uh, actually right now I'm, I'm in the process of, of putting together an edited volume of uh, stories of black historians. Uh, I was just working on the introduction today to go back to what Dr. Caldwell was saying that uh, really in post-World War II America and especially uh, post-1968, uh, black historians as well as uh, black social scientists and people in humanities really benefited probably more than any other class of scholars from the civil rights movement. I mean, you've, there's been such a big explosion of black studies and uh, history. And of course, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of spurious debate that's been created over uh, critical race theory, which is actually not something that's part of history. Uh, it's, 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 uh, from, it's a technique from law school is being used to really attack uh, the uh, structures that have been built over the last uh, 54 or so years. And so, uh, you know, we're really at a critical time and talking about the history of SIUE or, SI, or the SIU system is, is really part of the process of making sure that we have a foundation that will allow people to keep doing the work that we're doing when we're gone. Thank you very much. That is an incredibly important project that you're working on. Thank you for that. Dr. Timothy Staples, you're in East St. Louis and we're glad about that. So now tell us something about yourself. Thank you, Father Rock. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Timothy Staples and I begin my time with SIU uh, in 1992 as a student in the Upper Bound Science Awareness Program. And from there, I graduated high school and attended SIUC from 1994 to 97. And then due to family situations, I'm, I had the opportunity to transfer to SIUE 
where Dr. Patterson made sure that I finished along with Dr. Cheeseboro made sure that I turned some of my papers in on time. <laughs> in 2018, I returned to this area, had the opportunity and now I am the executive director of the East St. Louis Center. And it is continuing its work to serve the East St. Louis and surrounding communities in several programs, which including the high school up bound program that set me on a path, our early Head Start, Head Start program with currently seven managed centers throughout St. Clair County, our Veterans Upper Bound program, and our perform historical performing arts program. So I'm excited to lead a group of people who are continuing SIU's commitment to the East St. Louis people and the surrounding areas. Thank you very much. And you are living proof of some of the questions and answers we're going to be dealing with today. I think that Dr. Caldwell gave us a wonderful introduction to the general themes and purpose of this discussion today. And as she was talking, and as you panelists have been talking, I kept thinking of the great statement from Frederick Douglass, that if you teach a slave to read, he'll be forever unfit to be a slave. And that pushed him right on, on the pathway from slavery to freedom by learning and knowing. So I'm gonna ask this question of everyone and it's something that people have uh, offered us as a panel to reflect on. Why is it important to rethink history, especially to come up with a more accurate and complete narrative of SIU and all of its various campuses and iterations? And so we're gonna start basically in the same uh, order that we started before. Um, Dr. Patterson, would you like to you know, throw something up there? You know, I, I think that it is especially critical that history is revisited. Um, as we are experiencing right now, we understand that history is in the telling. It depends on who is telling the narrative. It depends on who is focused on what agenda as to what the narrative will be. Um, it depends on what and who determines truth as to what history will be. And if we are not the owners of our story in sharing information um, that is accurate, understanding the relevancy of it, uh, connecting uh, the roots uh, to the present, uh, then we know not where we go with our future. Mm -hmm. The foundation has been laid uh, the premise is clear, and it is important that it is not distorted by the teller of the story. Thank you. Thank you. That's really what critical race theory might be. Who tells the story and who's listening and to what purpose is the story being shared? Thank you very much. All right, then we're going to move right along like we have been doing so far. Dr. Flowers, would you like to kind of share something about why you think it's important to rethink this history and share the, a better version of it? Absolutely. I think that as when we um, look at the definition of, of uh, rethinking, we um, think about a subject or a policy or a course of action in order to make changes to it, basically. And I think that as Dr. Patterson just referenced, um, it's important that we understand who's who is telling the story and uh, where we're and 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 from which lens that story is being offered, basically. And I think that that uh, we we may not we not we may not be able to change history about SIU about where we've been, but we can talk about where we're going, basically. And from my perspective, um, having spent 30 years at the at SIUC, having having come come to Carbondale from St. Louis in the early 70s, um, I know a uh, know a lot about the academic side of SIU as well as the social side. I I have to confess, basically. 
but but I think it's important that that we acknowledge that there is some history there that we need to talk about, and it and it and it needs to be told from the perspective of people who have lived that history in so many different aspects, basically. So that's what I would add to that, Dr. Dr. Brown. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I'm sure we will get to that other side besides the academic later on in the conversation. Uh, we, I'm sure we will. Uh, Dr. Cheeseboro, tell us what your perspective is on this question, please. Well, uh, history, we need to always open up history because history's never, never finished. I mean, uh, there's always another perspective. There's always another batch of documents. Uh, there's always a, a different recollection. And uh, we forever need to look at these things. And then also, uh, I think one of the things that the last five uh, or six years really should have taught African-Americans is to simply, is, is being comfortable is dangerous. Uh, you, know, be, you know, feeling that you've arrived, feeling that uh, you're secure, is a good way to, to, to get your heart broken. And uh, I, I kind of think that, you know, I've, you know uh, I, I'm, I'm not a scientist, but I've really come to look at racism kind of like an endemic uh, disease, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like, like the plague or, 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 or the flu or something of that nature, that uh, under the right conditions, uh, it goes from being endemic uh, to being uh, an epidemic. I mean, the, 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 you know, it's always there. And, you know, really just like uh, public health, you know, encourages certain practices in order to maintain a safe environment. Uh, you know, history is part of the process that we really need to use to maintain uh, what we've achieved and, and also to make sure that people understand why the institutions that we've helped to create are important and why they need to survive. That was a very powerful answer. Thank you very much. Racism is an endemic to turn into an epidemic. Dr. Staples, it's your turn to bring your wisdom to the fore. I agree with all the panelists, but you know, the question that came to my mind, how do you map out a plan well, you know, without knowing where you've been? Or how do you seize upon opportunities without learning and understanding the experiences that came before that provided current opportunities? And we are at a crossroad, I know it's cliche, at the university where we now have developed um, people in place, in mission in place to address the issues of African Americans in our university spaces. So understanding the history will help us decide where we're going. You know, we, we, can't, we, we cannot paint a picture without having all of this information. Um, for example, in my world, you know, how do you uh, address the needs and make up for past ills with the people of East St. Louis unless you understand what happened? How do you motivate and, and, and get our current African-American students to success without dealing with some of the things that have created a base uh, uh, of experiences that I experienced and that students are still experiencing today. This weekend, I gave a talk in Mobile, Alabama as part of the descendants of the Pope Tilda celebration. And one of the things I mentioned to them was that I don't look at history or life as a straight line. I look upon it as a circle as I was taught about West African cultures. But the problem we have is sometimes we think that that circle is static. Oh my God, are we going through this again? Oh, how many times do we have to go through this? How can ain't nothing ever, but actually it spirals through time. So we're gonna see some things from a different perspective. Each time we get back to that same place in the dance circle, we're going to be different and everybody around us is going to be different and the context is going to be different. And we've got to tell that story and sing that song so that the young ones know it's not the same. It's similar and it's going to be your turn to add your voice to it. And the other thing I would like to say is in the Black tradition, 
That's all we've ever had are stories. When I teach a class, the, the course on the slave narratives, the first thing I tell them is these are not slave narratives, these are liberation narratives. But we get told so many of the traumatic, obsessive cruelties of slavery that we don't know how to listen to the double and triple meanings even of a Phyllis Wheatley poem. So I'm really glad that you all have offered your voices to all of that because I think that you all have established a theme now that we're gonna just move right on through, moving right on through this. Now, the next question that we got thrown at us was the question about how long in history have black people been part of the leadership team of SIU? And I think we should talk about that in a very specific way. The SIU campus, which starts back in 1869, they say, and what le whatever leadership meant, or when did Black people really become part of the leadership component of SIU itself? And then when it branches into all the other campuses, if anybody here would like to answer that question, what do you know about the leadership aspects of this? I'm going to throw that open to anybody. Well, I'll say this, that you know, of course, the, you know, there were students at, at Carbondale from the very beginning. Now, I don't know when the first black faculty come to Carbondale. I do know that if you look at SIUE, uh, there are a number of people I can think about, like, uh, you know, uh, Janetta Haley, I can think about Emil Jason, you think about Rudy Wilson. Uh, these were early faculty members. Uh, now, I can't remember his name, but I know that, that, that we had a, a, a black dean of the graduate school when I first came there in the 90s. He was originally from West Africa. And so, uh, you know, we, we've had people at, at, at SIU and upper administration uh, from time to time. The thing about it is that, uh, you know, people come and, and, and they go. Sometimes people forget about them. I mean, you know, uh, the, car, you know the SIU system had a black system president, you know, Dr. James Walker, uh, you know, who, who was who was there for a few years. Unfortunately, he died pretty early, you know, because of cancer. But we've had leadership from time to time. Uh, I think the thing about it is that often we've had leadership; it goes away, and then it's a long time for somebody else comes back. And you know, the 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 the, the, the this the mission is to create a culture where. Uh, African-Americans have prominent faces in leadership uh, for a prolonged period of time. Oh, and by the way, I, I, I can't forget a uh, uh, sister, uh, uh, Vanessa, oh my goodness, who, who uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm, 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 well, y'all help me out now uh, because she, she was there for a long time, you know. Uh, I mean, we, we've, had, we've, we've had people, but you know, the thing is to consistently have people there. You know, that's, 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 that's the struggle. For Dr. Flowers, you have been around a long time, you said. What do you remember about leadership uh, in, among Black uh, leaders at SIU from the time you were here to more recently? Who's that addressed to, Dr. Brown? Yeah, you. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, yeah, you. No, I okay. said that since you've been here for you as student and a faculty and administrator yourself, some of your re remembrances of the people who were significant in SIU's leadership from your time here. Sure. You know, I found some information that that like indicated that that uh, Dr. Annette Hogue was the first the first a black woman to receive a faculty appointment at SIUC in 1957, mm. 1957. I think um, Dr. Harold Bardo and everyone knows knows him basically um, the first African American in the uh, in the uh, in the College of Education and and Human Services and the uh, counselor counselor ed ed uh, program. Um, Harvey Welsh uh, was on loan to SIUE as the uh, director of their uh, housing efforts. Efforts, basically, in the uh, mid 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 uh, mid eighties. Uh, Harvey Harvey Welsh was the first a black uh, dean of 
Student Affairs Dean of uh, Dean of uh, Students here at here at SIUC. Dr. James Walker um, was the uh, was the first and only Black President Chancellor because those uh, terms have been uh, inter inter interchanged over the years of the SIU system, basically. So I think that I think that my experiences with the university have been uh, have been varied uh, uh, but I've been impressed I can't I can't forget Dr. Ben Shepherd the only the uh, first uh, black um, provost of SIUC so so SIUC has a has a history of like trying to trying to do the right things to actually uh, promote individuals who are qualified, who are well uh, deserving, and things along that particular nature. I felt honored uh, uh, because I, I was the only first and first and only a uh, director of the Rehabilitation Institute that was like founded at the university in, in like 1954, and it uh, and it like took until 19 until 2009 for for myself to be appointed in that position as the um, as the uh, director so I I think SIUC has has a has a good has a good history but I don't think that uh, the university needs to rest on its laurels and saying well we've done these things in the past we still have a lot that we need to do at the I, university I agree and we're not going to forget the fact that uh, one person started out as a small stream and ended up like the mighty Mississippi, and his name was Seymour Bryson. Uh, How could I forget Dr. Bryson? I mean, right? no, no, no. He wasn't going to let you forget it. I mean, he just tapped me on the shoulder and said, you better mention me. And I said, yes, Dr. Bryson, whatever you say, because that's the way he was and still is. But no, I mean, as uh, an organizer and developer and coordinator of all sorts of anti-poverty programs in the 1960s and then becoming a dean in the 70s, and then becoming, you know, uh, the associate vice chancellor and director of this and director of that, and managed to maintain almost all of those programs under his watchful care for however many decades. So we, we do have that history. And I mean, he was, you know, in close collaboration with Rudy Wilson up at SIU Edwardsville. So you've had a lot of people who have been, and that's another, I think, important part to notice that to note that the black administrators and faculty, Harry Wilson Barlow is an associate dean of students who, who was a caretaker for all of the RSOs and really trained them in leadership. She, she left it before I got here, but her, her power and influence is still here. So we've got yes. a lot of people who were interacting across the campuses too. So I think, we, I think we've done something about that. Now here is the great trick question. And I know two people who are going to be able to answer this because one of them already started answering it. Were African-American students in the student body from the very beginning of SIU? Now, I'm going to give that both to Dr. Flowers and to Dr. Cheeseboro. I'm going to let Dr. Cheeseboro. I think we should, don't you? Yes. Yeah, well, uh, Black students were at SIU uh, Carbondale and, and also SIUE from the very beginning. Uh, uh, Carbondale in particular, it is really has had a historically important mission uh, because, because of where it's located. I mean, Carbondale is in the far south of Illinois. Uh, you know, you can, uh, you know, people in, in Western Tennessee, people in Western Kentucky, uh, people in Southeastern Missouri could go to Carbondale and get master's degrees, could get doctorates uh, when they could not go to other schools. Uh, you know, people who, uh, you know, who would have to go a long ways away. I mean, uh, and, and so if you look throughout uh, the uh, Mississippi River Valley, the Ohio River Valley, uh, it's sprinkled with uh, principals, uh, uh, administrators uh, who got their masters, who got their PhDs from Carbondale. Uh, so Carbondale is not only important for the state of Illinois, it was, it was really important for surrounding areas. And so from that standpoint, uh, it really it, it is a school that historically has had a very important mission, not only for Illinois, but really for the whole region. Yes, 
Absolutely. And I think that, and as we were previewing this panel discussion, uh, Dr. Flowers mentioned something about the Dunbar Society at SIU Carbondale, well, SIU period, which was a group of students uh, who organized themselves to have their own self-determining community here, formal. And in some ways, given the, the fluctuating numbers of SIU, of student, black students at SIU Carbondale, you've had as many as two or three times the number of black students on this campus as you would find at some of the historically black colleges. So you had quite a powerful influ influx of that. And I mean, about eight, nine years ago, before we had started our decline, I was noticing that we had two or 3,000 black students here, which was at least two or three times Fisk or some of the other small historically black colleges. Did we have the, the administrative support system that would have made that even more successful? Not really, but the presence has always been there from the, the young women and Alexander Lane. And I have a picture that somebody handed me the day I arrived here in 1997 of a French class in 1915 with at least three black students in it. Hmm. So we've always had that. So this is something that's really um, quite worth noticing. Anybody want to add anything to that before we just smooth on ourselves to the next question? I didn't think so. So anyway, <laughs> <laughs> now this is an odd question, but this came from different people. So I'm not going to say that they're odd just because the question strikes me is odd. How, why, when did the SIU satellite campuses, which is a kind of a loaded term right there, get started? And was there deliberate outreach to Black people with each of these initiatives? They're talking about dental school, medical school, pharmacy, nursing, law school, all sorts of things, Springfield, Alton, all over the place. So I don't have an answer to that because I don't know how and when they got started, but I know why. I mean, because we needed them. So anybody from any of these other campuses who'd like to join in on that one, let's take take a shot at it. Well, you know, I'll one say, thing, oh, go ahead, Dr. I was going to say one thing you always have to kind of remember about uh, SIU Edwardsville is that it's located in the Metro East and. Uh, you know, uh, the thing about the Metro East is always interesting is that, you know, it's a metropolitan area that's defined by the Missouri side, but yet the Illinois side is the second largest metropolitan area in the state of Illinois. I mean, it's considerably smaller than Chicago, but still it's the second largest one in the state of Illinois. And, you know, if you go back, uh, especially if you're looking at post-war years, uh, when the area was really booming in population, uh, there was a great deal of local push to develop education services uh, in the area. Uh, you know, Carbondale, you know, started off, in, you know, setting up place in Belleville. Uh, you know, Edwardsville uh, Chamber of Commerce had, had put together a study, paid people to, to show that there was a need in the area. And, and so, you know, th that, that urge was there. And, and you know, at, at that time, uh, you know, in the 1950s, uh, you know, you had, you, had the, you had the growth of, uh, uh, of, uh, you know, like, for instance, veterans benefits, you know, money being made available for people to go to school, uh, you know, growing populations. It made all the sense in the world to put uh, school in the area. Uh, it made all the sense in the world to have professional schools. It was, it, was, it was kind of a common sense thing. Now, I know that some of us have some, uh, I know uh, Dr. Patterson has some information uh, at a more personal level, but I think from a, from a purely demographic standpoint, uh, it, it, was a very, it was a rational thing to expand into the area and the, and the demand was there. And uh, I, I would just say this, that uh, the demand has continued to exist because, you know, one of the things that people don't realize is that, you know, nowadays, you know, with the decline of in, in industry, because, you know, in, in the post-World War II area, period, uh, Metro East was a huge manufacturing area. Uh, but, you know, nowadays, of course, information technology is a much more important thing. And, you know, uh, south of Springfield, uh, 
the largest employer in the state of Illinois is Scott Air Force Base. But in the Metro East, right behind Scott Air Force Base is SIUE. And so really uh, education uh, is just really just central to the modern economy. You know, it, it, you know uh, the, the system could not function without it. And so uh, from, a, you know, you know, from a purely capitalist standpoint, you know, nothing sentimental or you know, bleeding hard about it. it, it made sense. But I, I, I will defer to the rest of the panel because I know there's some more personal stories to be told. So Dr. Staples and Dr. Patterson, we're, we're listening for you. And he told you to get personal. So go ahead and do it. Well, well, for that question, I wasn't going to get personal. I was going to cover some of the things that uh, Dr. Cheeseboro talked about because oftentimes, as the story would be told, I feel like a storyteller, you know, we always talk about um, well, um, the, the general narrative is, you know, SIU started, you know, its outreach in East St. Louis and then they left, you know, but, you know, there are some other pieces to that. As Dr. Cheeseboro said, the first classes were at the Belleville Community College, which is now Southwest Illinois College, which is a partner on this current campus uh, with us. But, you know, the, it is often thought also that um, after uh, you know, SIU moved to Edwardsville, that that's when the outreach of the grant program started. And that's not, that, that's not true, but it's widely believed that. But at, that t- at the time that SIUE was providing classes at the Morris Elementary School, you know, this is of course, as Dr. Cheeseboro said in the 50s, you think about what was happening with opportunities for college education and there was money there and there was opportunities. It was an untapped area. So, um, as well as college opportunities were occurring, the federal grants came about, you know, in the early 60s. So then um, to, to solidify part of this, um, getting more students, getting more people involved, as Dr. Cheeseboro talked about, that's when the first grants were applied for to address about 100, um, you know, first generation students in the East St. Louis area. So um, wasn't until 1965 that, you know, the Edwardsville campus opened and then what you had left were the, those outreach, uh, the outreach in, in, in terms of grant programming. So um, that's, that's the how and the when and, and the why um, that I wanted to bring to the table. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yes. Dr. Patterson. I would like to add uh, uh, to that. Um, actually, I'll respond to that question and the next upcoming question Thank you. about the footprint of, of East St. Louis. But I'm going to start with um, SIUE's uh, archivist, uh, Steve Kerber. He has said, and I quote, I frequently receive questions from folk who think the university was removed from East St. Louis. That is simply incorrect, he says. SIU system president, Delight Morris. Now, by the way, Delight Morris uh, was the longest serving president of the SIU system. He was in office from 1948 to 1970 for for, for 22 years. He says that the SIU system president, Delight Morris, never at any time intended or committed to building the new campus in East St. Louis. He says, from the first, Morris intended to build the new campus near Edwardsville. That ends his quote. Now, in in doing some reviewing and some reading and preparing for today, um, someone shared with me a book entitled Teaching and Learning in the Land of Lincoln. And it is the history of SIU's beginning. Um, It's been reported that, that while writing the book, we were earlier talking about the telling of the story, the significance of history being shared, Uh, We were talking about uh, the truth is in the telling. It was reported that while writing this book, uh, people felt like the truth was not being told. Uh, And there was a big blow up 
uh, and people stopped uh, working on the project and some other people uh, eventually stepped in uh, to finish it. Uh, Illinois House of Representatives, uh, Wyvetter Young, <coughs> who represented uh, the 114th district, including East St. Louis, uh, from 1975 until she passed in 2008, um, reportedly expressed th the same sentiments. Um, it was also told that Catherine Dunham, the renowned cultural anthropologist and choreographer, uh, who our communications building here on the SIUE campus is named for, she requested that her name um, not be listed uh, in, in the book project. But what happens in East St. Louis, um, 10 years later, I think is far more interesting. Um, SIUE officially began a special program in East St. Louis called the Experiment in Higher Education, EHE. Now the name uh, really sounds ominous, but that's what it was called, the experiment in higher education. And it was birthed at a time uh, of civil rights unrest, um, anti-Vietnam activism, uh, the war on poverty, and there was a large population of people of color uh, whose access to affordable um, higher education was, was very limited. And this funding came from um, EOC, uh, Equal Opportunity Commission, um, the Department of Education, uh, and some of the funds were from the, the state of Illinois. But there was a small uh, group of African-American professors and most of them came from the South. There were two white uh, professors from Kent State University and a Jewish uh, physicist who happened to have been a member of the Communist Party. His name was Hyman uh, Frankel. But they were all under the direction of Dr. Edward W. Crosby, who was from uh, the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. And Dr. Crosby had served in the U.S. military and was stationed uh, for a long time in England. And he had a, a bachelor's degree in Spanish. He had a master's degree in German, uh, both from Kent State University. And he had a PhD in uh, medieval German languages and literature and uh, medieval history and both from the University of Kansas. So he and his team of fellow African-American professors and Kent State alumni developed a unique curriculum. And this is so exciting to me because of its resonance today that taught their students what they needed for college without denying the culture of their respective communities. The EHE teachers, the teachers also received training as counselors and employed an each one teach one methodology wherein um, students largely were expected and taught how to help each other. It became a community of relationships that was rich with academics and culture. And the EHE curriculum sought to validate the culture of its students using examples and, and situations and language that was familiar to the students to teach the subject matter. For 23 years, this project functioned with one purpose in mind, and that was to provide an environment that reaffirmed the value of African American culture while learning the academic skills needed to graduate from a four-year school. They blackenized, they ethnicized, and they cross-culturized the curriculum. An example uh, would be Sociology 101. Instead of introduction to sociology, it was socialization of the black child. And it was taught by a Dr. Joyce Ladner who was 24 years old. Oh my. She was the youngest PhD in the country. She came from Tougaloo University to study at Wash U. And they lived in Pruitt Igo. Wash U put these families up in Pruitt Igo. Pruitt Igo was a, a housing uh, project uh, for black families. Mm. But they came here with these revolutionary and avant-garde 
uh, teaching methods. And the implementation of that kind of black pedagogy led to the successful graduation of hundreds of students that wouldn't have made it otherwise. That program, I'll just add this, that program developed in East St. Louis under the direction of Dr. Edward Crosby Gosh, has been cited as the first African-American centered collegiate curriculum in the United States. That experiment in higher education's influence on the development of black studies in universities across the country, across the nation has, has also been cited. So it was due to the amount of the brain power and the resources and the time that they had, but they forged a pedagogy that put the student at the center of their learning. And this group of black educators, uh, this black studies consortium did not confine their efforts to East St. Louis. They offered consulting services to universities from, from California uh, to New York. Uh, and that's just so exciting to me. I just had to share that. Uh, yes, you did have to share that. Yeah. Now, what, one very technical point from, that I need to make sure of. You said 10 years later. So that means in 1975, which was 10 years after the Edwardsville campus. Is it was 1966. It's when those programs, each eight, the experiment in higher education began. 1966. So it was 1966. That's what I wanted to know because so then the 23 years that it was in existence, it was up to 1989. Yes, yes. And why did it go away? We can talk about that. Well, I, <laughs> that'll be another whole discussion. <laughs> now, as a point of privilege, when, when, when Representative Wyvetta Young's name was mentioned, I smiled because my mother worked for her father when she left high school and babysat Wyvetta and her sister Ruth. Oh, my second footnote, as I mentioned again in our preview warm up. Uh, the highest ranking black person in the Illinois legislature at that time was my godfather. First representative and then Senator Kenneth Hall, why Veta Young replaced him as representative when he became senator. And I'm happy that the archivist says what he says about um, Delight Morris. And I doubt if Kenneth's papers are in the archives, though they should be, but he kept some rather confidential ones, which may never surface. The argument that he made about East St. Louis being that, he did not win that argument, obviously, but the argument was quite loud and forceful. And I think in some ways, this experiment, since he was a very powerful person in the legislature, that had something to do with the political compromises that people had. The last footnote I want to make was to a previous conversation was, I don't think people understand that S this goes back to what Dr. Cheeseborough was saying about how SIU Carbondale was a, was a magnet for so many different people. You can't find black morticians in the Metro East area, but especially East St. Louis, from the Nashes to the officers who did not come to school here back in the 1930s. And the same thing is true for the, since it was a teacher's college, the educational system of East St. Louis depended on black teachers coming down here to be educated. You couldn't go anywhere in East St. Louis when I was a child without meeting somebody who'd gone to SIU. I yes. wanted to add those two footnotes. And now we're going to move into the real Can heart I of just this. add one, one more thing? Before you better. I'm going to shut up. I just want to say we cannot have a conversation about, SI, or about SIUE's relationship to East St. Louis without making reference to the Dr. Eugene Redmond, you know, the renowned oh, emeritus this, cultural now, and, language and, professor and, and poet and laureate. He, and he left some money on your desk so you could say that about him. <laughs> <laughs> he only contributed over 30 years, and we have uh, his uh, in our library here on the, campus. Yes, you got that whole and you got the whole archive named after him. Yes, yes, and his contemporaries, of course, you know, were Gwendolyn Brooks and Maya Angelou and Nikki Giovanni, uh, and uh, and present company included. Uh, I've known Eugene Redmond for quite some time, and we've shared a number of projects together, which again we won't talk about. Uh, 
No, he was on the 1917 East St. Louis Centennial Commission. He was one of the people that helped me to visionize it. So anyway, that's very important because he's never left the city and he's brought the world to it. That's extremely important. We could go, if we wanted to do the litany of people, who, of educators who have made a profound impact on East St. Louis, that would be another whole discussion. And Dr. Mahoney might want to bring some of those names into his final remarks because he's met people like Reginald Petty and others and Donald McHenry and all these other people. So we got this, we've got this moving. Now, here's a nice question. You've already done it. I've done some of it. If there's anybody else who wants to add anything to that other question that we were given about where the campuses were supposed to be, my last, I promise you my last footnote is, we can talk about all those sites, but you can't leave out the Broadview Hotel because that is a sacred space in East St. Louis history and in a sacred space in SIU history because that was the spot where you had people hanging from the light poles during the 1917 massacre. And it was also one of the great spaces for the classes that were being held sponsored by SIU in East St. Louis. And to see what is left of that city, it's, it's, it, it breaks my heart because I caught the bus there every day leaving grade school. That's my last footnote. Does it, is there anything anybody else wants to add about the intentionality of SIU being in East St. Louis? Because I think we pretty much covered it. But I'm willing to open this up to anybody because I'm a nice person. Dr. Caldwell told me so. Well, <laughs> She wanted to tell me that. Okay, so here's, here's, here's where we're going to be going now. And I think we've also answered the question about the footprints of SIU in East St. Louis and in the Metro East area, to be really fair to both what Drs. Cheeseboro and Staples have said, it's got to be the entire area. Because when you go to the meetings and listen to what the dental school is doing in East St. Louis, and in some in Cahokia and Centerville, and what the nursing programs are doing, and what the medical school is doing is outreach. It's more than just a footprint. It's a it's a grasping, compassionate hand of healing. Also, I want to say that. Now, I just am a visitor here, so y'all tell me some other things that you might think about the important footprints of SIU across the entire SIU geography from Carbondale to Springfield. Don't be shy people. Okay, can I just add um, this commentary? Um, another of the lessons, one of the lessons of, of, um, of East St. Louis, it's something that we know to be true. And it is the importance of that interdisciplinary um, holistic approach to Black education. Um, in East St. Louis, EHE, that experiment, was partnered with Catherine Dunham's uh, Performing Arts Training Center. It was known as PATSI. And this symbiotic relationship between EHE and uh, PATSI attracted educators and cultural icons from all over the United States and beyond to East St. Louis. It generated a lot of energy in the community and attracted uh, community members from all walks of life. And the implementation of that kind of pedagogy proved very successful and led to the graduation of many that wouldn't have made it otherwise. And that kind of pedagogy is what we lead with in SOAR. I just wanted to say that. As well. You had to say that. Thank you very much, because the second second or third time that uh, Catherine Dunham's name has come up in this conversation, we, we, we cannot minimize her impact. Coming here to Edward, to Carbondale and then moving to East St. Louis and teaching and lifting up 
one of my relatives, some of my grade school classmates. It, it, she, she's had a profound impact. And again, her spirit is still there. So she does need to be mentioned because she committed herself. And as she was leaving this planet physically, she was telling some of those collaborators that she was talking about, don't forget East St. Louis. And one of these days, we're going to have to go find them and ask them why they forgot it. I, I want to um, have a little commentary as well on Dr. Patterson, but Dr. Uh, uh, Father Brown, first, I have to make note from a previous name mentioned, I am a proud former student of Seymour Bryce and, and his program. And so I, I love hearing that name. I'm waiting for the statue. Um, going back to what Dr. Patterson was saying, as we talked at the earlier question, why is it important to revisit the history? I can promise you some of my staff listening to Dr. Patterson right now, maybe just as I am saying in my mind, wow, what amazing things that I can do if that concept and understanding of the work in East St. Louis was present within all of the system today and particularly within SIUE. And I'm going to be careful because I just don't have the back to pack up my office today. But that understanding that at the very beginning, there was this very close um, coordination uh, between need, need and outreach. So it was SIU system outreaching to the area to provide courses. It then was individuals within that outreach that looked at the 100 plus or whatever the demographic of students that were first generation that met these programs at the social economic level. And so there was an understanding. It was like a train with all of these things going forward. You know, we need to really revisit that history because it's not, it's not the same now. So when you talk about the footprint now, um, I don't think the students know SIU as I knew SIU um, because not just being able to catch the bus up to SIUE to do work and to engage in programming, but having, you know, Brenda Major send buses from Carbondale to pick folks up at the East St. Louis high schools and take them to Carbondale. So we have to look at what has happened. There, there are some success stories that are behind us that somehow, just like this pedagogy, have gotten lost. You know, you can, you know, I was unfortunately on a, 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 a call or a Zoom call about, you know, um, you know, programming, and we were working on a grant with another local school district, and I was talking about things here, and we had a faculty member of 20 plus years that said, whoa, I've never heard of that. Oh, my goodness. You know, so... That history, we have to go back and capture that, 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 that spirit that was involved in what Dr. Patterson talked about so everyone on Edwardsville campus can understand that the work we do is very important. And folks often ask, they say, oh, well, everything should be good because, see, I have a chancellor. You know, usually the chancellor, provost, and all of those individuals set the, you know, the mood for, you know, or, or the privilege for certain things. Well, I have a chancellor that comes here all the time and it believes this is important work. I have a provost that comes and spends time, even office time, and believe this important work, but it get lost with the rest of the campus. And I always ask that question, why? Is it, um, okay, I'm really going to get in trouble. Is it the population? Why? Why the top down? Oh, let's not talk about how many times President Mahoney and Vice President Caldwell has been here. They've been to more in, uh, places in East St. Louis that I done forgot about, and I grew up here. So I'm looking forward to us revisiting those things and making a real difference, you know, in this area and, you know, other areas of the state that have high um, uh, African-American um, concentration. And we're, we're gonna I'll, be, I'll stop. We're going to be moving along to close down the general panel discussions in case there are some questions from the participants out in the world who want to send questions to us that we can deal with for a few minutes. But I think that I would really like to have Dr. Flowers say something about 
because of his incredible contributions here about the collaborations when you talk about how this works now, the organizations on campus and the civic, cultural, social organizations in the communities are also part of the SIU history, experience, and mission. And I would really like to have Dr. Flowers, since he really is still very much involved in all of that, just give us a perspective on how that works. Uh, can I just make one comment first? Uh, oh, sure. I think someone made the uh, comment earlier about a lot of the faculty, a lot of the teachers in the East St. Louis school districts were educated at SIU, basically. Um, that was a... That was, his, that was the same thing for the other side of the river as well. Uh, Sumner High School of Ashan High School, St. Louis. Some of the some of those teachers, principals, administrators were were educated at SIUC. Basically, uh, the other comment I just want to make was that um, as Father Brown uh, talked about earlier, uh, back when there were three thousand, four thousand. African American students on the on the SIU campus, we were known as the HBCU of Illinois, mm -hmm. of the HBCU of Illinois, because students were not at the U of I, Illinois State, and those other other in state schools as they, as 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 they were at SIU. I just want to make that point known and thank you and i think there was a there was a train there was a linkage between siu and memphis too uh i know uh, lots of people who who were from memphis who who like came to siu for their uh, graduate work and then went back to um memphis and became administrators basically now getting getting to the point that you asked me to uh, talk about, Father Brown, um, um, the the there was a time uh, probably probably uh, before I got here. I know it was actually, but but African American students could not live on campus. Obviously, they were like living in the uh, community, basically, and the uh, NAACP at that point was one of those. Uh, programs or one of those organizations that like helped find lodging for uh, students who were on who were, like live who were like going to SIU but were not able to live on campus. Basically, uh, uh, we uh, talk about the uh, Harvey Harvey uh, Harvey uh, Welsh's who was a who was a, who was the first um, first a uh, black to be awarded a basket basketball varsity letter at SIU, but he was not able to live on campus even as a student. Basically, okay, uh, there are some issues there. Uh, we talk about social organizations. Simon Gamero a sorority was was the first black Greek organization to be on this campus in 1930. I'm sorry, 1930. Two actually, um, um, Alpha, Alpha Alpha Phi Alpha was the uh, first uh, fraternity on its campus, chartered on its campus in 1934. So, so there's some there's some history there that 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 I brought African American students to this university as part of Greek organizations, as part of uh, social organizations, individuals in the community, Bob Stalls, um, uh, Richard Hayes are two examples who have a, who had a long history of like working, being, 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 being a part of the community as residents, but also involved with the university basically. So I think uh, there's that, there's that history that I think that we're trying to continue on. Uh, my a spouse is the current current in NAAC president. I'm a past president, um, you know, and uh, we think it, 
think it's important since we live here, uh, we need to be a part and we need, need to be active in our in our uh, community. And I'll just stop there and let others jump in if they have to, if they want to. Thank you so much, because I would like to hear from the people in the East St. Louis and Edwardsville areas talk about, do you see some of those same kinds of civic social interactions and support systems going on there that that Dr. Flowers has just talked about because you can't have it in isolation. And I think Dr. Staples, you are perfect proof of that. But if there are any other specifics that anybody would like to you know, put in, into this conversation, I'd really appreciate hearing it. And I, yeah, I would say some of those things are still going on. Our NAACP, I'm here in East St. Louis, have the AXO program that continues and they meet on this campus with, with the classes and are very involved. They, a lot of their meetings happen here as well and, and very much involved in education initiatives and connected with our chancellor's office. And I guess I'd just say that for Edwardsville, I know I was active in uh, establishing a, a student chapter of the NAACP at the SIE campus. It kind of fell apart during the pandemic, but you know, hopefully we'll get it back running in the next uh, few years, uh, back to where it was you know, before uh, things really went bad. And I also add um, to doc, uh, Dr. Flowers talk about Greek life. You know, um, I, it, my time at Edwardsville, I, I did during that time. I really, it's funny that I've worked in student affairs because I really didn't know student affairs then. I said outside of Dr. P, it was the Alpha Phi Alphas, and and I didn't know a lot about fraternity and sorority because I went to a Pentecostal church and my pastor didn't like it. So, um, but they were her, the group. <laughs> that provided student affairs for us. And I could find an alpha in Peck Hall to tell me how to navigate things because I, I just didn't know. Um, so, you know, when I think about my role in, in my past work in student affairs, I remember that I learned a lot and understood a lot because how they stood in the gap um, for me as a, a African-American first-generation student you know, to help to navigate the campus and be successful. And I'm still not a member of anything, but it was that group. That's important for us to hear. And I think that what you all are telling us in this group is that the communities help to define what education is supposed to be. I've told people over and over that when I was doing my father's funeral. His voice came into my head saying, get all the education you can, get all the education you can. So I'd been out of graduate school for 10 years and I went back to get my PhD. Uh, when two of you all had brought up Dr. Walker, who was part of my heart. I, this morning I was telling the panel before we started this that I had to go to the Heron Hospital to anoint someone who is dying from COVID complications. But I was standing in the front room of the Walker's house here when I had to anoint him and then do his funeral and then go down to Murfreesboro, Tennessee some years later to do his wife's funeral. Um, we are basically always carrying these legacies and knowing that people come into the campus and they leave the campus, but there's people sitting out there. We could just go for days again in Edwardsville and in East St. Louis and God knows in Carbondale, but Carl Flowers was talking about, about how the people had to live in the communities. Some of the old people who had their rooms open, some of the elders of this community are still caring and concerned about what goes on on this campus in ways that some other people never would be. So the next question is, what are we doing now to restore and renew some of the legacies and histories. If everybody could give me one or two things about that, we could move right along to something else. What are we doing to renew and restore some of these legacies that we've talked about? What are we doing or what should we be doing? Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> both, thank you. I've never been either or, it's both. Okay. 
Well, you know. well, I would like to I would like to mention what we are doing in this moment. Um, Dr. Caldwell's work is opening the path further, uh, furthering the communications uh, of understanding, um, having uh, her in the position uh, that she sits now uh, is is so critically needed. It's a, it's a pivotal position. Uh, and the presence of her being in this position for the short period of time uh, that she has served has been incredibly impactful and powerful, her ability to bring people to the table and have these conversations. So I just want the opportunity uh, as we're here looking at reflecting, looking and reflecting um, on what we need to be doing. Um, and and the the critical importance of what we are doing, uh, thanks to to you, Dr. Carwell, as well as you, Dr. Mahoney. We know that the leadership uh, for these kinds of changes start at the top, uh, and it uh, is not lost on me um, where you all sit and your expectations of all of us. Thank you. Amen. Someone else. You know, it just it just occurred to me as you were asking your question, that it would be a good idea to get a course on the books on SIU history. Uh, I, you know, that's, that's I'm, I'm gonna have to look into that to see about developing a course and getting it on the books. I mean, that would be uh, something that I, I think, it, 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 that could be part of the gen ed that, at, at the university. I mean, you know, if I get it together, I mean, I know I'd be happy to share uh, syllabus with uh, Carbondale because because I think a, a proper history would, 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 would of course encompass both campuses. But I think that that would be a really a good thing to have in the Gen Ed if they were if they were an SIU history course. I mean, a freshman level history course. Um, well, I, yeah, I I agree with you, and so I'm going to give you this assignment, Dr. Cheeseboro. <laughs> um, <laughs> I want you to contact somebody who followed you to Murray State. Dr. Brian Clardy, because when he was doing his dissertation research here, he did an incredible amount of research on the Black presence at SIU, especially in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. He was uh, an, an incredibly gifted scholar in those days and one of the best teachers we ever had in the Africana Studies program here. He was, my first year here was his last year before he got his PhD but he's down there at Murray State. And so I think that I was wondering before whether or not the two of you all have worked together, but you just came up with the idea for exactly why you should be working together. So I expect something on my desk within the next two months. <laughs> well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to look him up. I mean, um, you know, I, I always <laughs> think about Murray State. I remember when I first got that job, uh, a fellow told me that when he, when he first got hired at Murray State, the man told him, so, you know, it's not the end of the earth here, but you can see it from where we are. <laughs> and so, you know, I was always, you know, it's, it's, it's a good school, but, but, we, but, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, 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 it's, it's a uh, non-religious purgatory, so to speak, you know, to be, to be in Callaway County, Kentucky. Well, and I understand so, that. <laughs> I understand that. Now I'm going to, I know that Dr. Caldwell will be sending piercing whistle sounds in my earphones if I don't start moving this thing along because she's very non, you know, non-judgmental and all. But there was a question about what is the status of Africana studies at SIUC and SIUE. I will say this, we're in a process of renewing and restoring and expanding. SIU went through a problematic reorganization over a three year period. And now we have something that is still in the process of being ratified and stabilized called the School of Africana and Multicultural Studies. And part of its mission and intentionality is to be interacting on a very strong and consistent level among the campuses. So something like your gen ed program, but eventually I would like to see that School of African and Multicultural Studies offer the master's degree. And that would have to be collaborative the same way the nursing schools is collaborating with SIU Carbondale and, and Edwardsville, et cetera. So that's kind of where we are. The other point is, from the 1960s, we do know about the Black Panther presence on SIU's campus 
pushing black studies to be established here. And the fact that it is still here and now moved from a minor to a major to a school says something about the resilience and the persistence of everything we have talked about. And it also says something about me having been here 25 years, but let's just move on to somebody else. Okay, we've got about three or four minutes to kind of anybody who wants to add anything either to the status of the educational program, but I'm really proud of what SIU Edwardsville is doing Black Studies. I really am. It has been a joy every time I have visited or interacted with people. I just want to give that kind of, you know, unsolicited uh, ecumenium. So anyway, uh, how do you all see that? Or is there a closing comment you'd like to make before we start easing ourselves on? The amazing thing is, and Todd Bryson, somehow related to Seymour Bryson, has sent me a note saying that they don't have questions, but they got a lot of shout outs and enthusiastic responses to this panel discussion today, which I think is terrifying to me because that means that somebody in charge of this is probably going to try to get us to do it again. Oh. And we're going to have to talk to her about that. But at any rate. <laughs> you know what, Father Brown, I want to um, make a few comments and, and actually to capitalize off of uh, your question as far as what are we doing? And I'm actually looking at a, at a chronological timeline of just some uh, recent hires. And as we talk about the history, I think we're like perfectly positioned uh, to strengthen the work. I think we're perfectly positioned to uh, make SIU more transformative. And it goes back to something I thought that Dr. Cheeseboro said that was powerful is that we can't get comfortable, you know, uh, because that's dangerous. And I also would think that when we look throughout history, people who got comfortable in some ways made themselves eligible for genocide. So I think that's, that's something that we wanna uh, pay close attention to as well. So I think about um, President Mahoney beginning his tenure as the 10th president in March 1st. We had Dr. Austin Lane be appointed in May of 2020. Camille Davidson began her tenure as the Dean of SIU School of Law in July 1st, 2020. We had the School of Dental Medicine appoint Dr. Cornell Thomas as their CDO in January 21st. Dr. Pembroke hired Dr. Harris, Jessica Harris, to be the Chancellor for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. Vanessa Brown, Dr. Vanessa Brown, was appointed as the Intercollegiate Athlete Staff Inaugural Director for DEI. My position was hired in April of last year. Austin Lane hired Dr. Paul Frazier in June of last year. We have the lovely... Uh, Dr. Patterson here today, who was appointed to her role in July. And so if you think about these, it's like month after month after month. Then we had Dr. Uh, Jessica Harris appoint Lindy Wagner to serve as Vice Chancellor for Inclusive Excellence, Education and Development. Dr. Robin Hughes appointed Dr. Natasha Flowers as the first Assistant Dean for Anti-Racism, Equity and Inclusion. And she assumed her position in September of 21st. In November, Dean Davidson, just a year later, appointed Dean Mike Ruiz to serve as the coordinator for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then we're still making history because just in a few days, in a few weeks, we will have the first ever African-American male president assume his role, Dr. Minor, James Minor, as the 10th president um, for SIUE. So just really within the course of a few short years, we have had a lot of significant changes. And I think that this is our opportunity to seize and it's our opportunity to lose as well. So I am very excited about being here for such a time as this, because I think with, with our efforts, as we even see on this call, people are just mesmerized, I think, at the knowledge that has been imparted uh, today. It's been a very rich and full discussion. And again, I think that we are, I will use the word perfectly positioned to do great work um, at SIU at a time of this. And this is actually rare. I've worked in so many institutions. If we look across higher ed, we will not see this type of critical mass. This is a powerful moment that we can seize on and we can do really great things and make a national footprint for SIU and what it, what, and what it looks like to be a truly anti-racist, inclusive, diversity and equitable institution. So that's what I'm most excited about. But I thought it was just powerful to hear those names and to think about the appointments that have been made, not even over two years, just about a year and a half. 
and it, it's been it's been amazing. Dr. Caldwell, you really brought this home in the most powerful way. And I'm going to go back to the image I started off with about the circle and what I have taught people and why I get so upset with people who do the Sankofa bird backwards. It's counterclockwise. So we could also add counterintuitive. We could add counter anything. But Black culture has always been counter to the dominant voice, story, history, counter. And if there's anything that you just brought alive in my heart with, your, with, with that chronology, and we both know that there's still some other names we can be adding to it, but those are the big names that we can see. The problem we have that will make it so desperately necessary for us to do something in a counter way especially at SIU Carbondale, is continuity. I've been here for 24 plus years and we've had 14 chancellors. We've had a whole raft of provosts. We've had people on faculty who I have said, I should be getting on the bus waving goodbye to them, but they've been getting on the bus going to other places to develop and carry on through time, to have people like Dr. Flowers, who came here and has stabilized so much of what he was known for and committed himself to. That stability goes back to the oldest song I can tell you right now. Like a tree planted by the water, I shall not be moved. We got to have some people singing that as their theme song as they come here. Because otherwise, it's just going to be blowing in the wind. Now, I ain't got no more to say. Anybody else want to add a commentary to this before we turn it over to the person who's been getting some pretty good uh, publicity here today? And I just want to make sure he knows that we appreciate from March 1st when he arrived here. Because he scared me when he first got here. I ain't scared of him no more. So, Dr. Staples, I just want you to know you ain't got to pack those suitcases. If I ain't packing mine, you ain't got to pack yours. But as anybody else on the panel want to have another comment before we move ourselves on down to the to the wire? My goodness. Dr. Caldwell, we must have done it, huh? What a shy group, finally. Well, now, do you want to introduce Dr. Mahoney or should he introduce himself or what? No, you go ahead and introduce him. After all, you can, you've you been talking about him all along. So just say something about it. Well, thank you. Uh, you have been masterful, um, Dr. Father Brown, in your, um, in your role as moderator. And this has been a very rich uh, discussion. I've learned a great deal. And um, I'm actually happy to be continuing these conversations, but I do want to turn it over to our system president, uh, Dr. Mahoney, who has deep convictions about anti-racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and many of the positions that I have mentioned um, have been cultivated and fostered under his leadership. So it's just been a joy uh, to serve alongside him and to be able to envision uh, this work and to be able to do this work with a collective group of uh, committed, um, I would say, catalysts and game changers. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Mahoney. Thank you, Dr. Caldwell, and, and thank you for your leadership, um, both today and putting this together and just throughout um, every day uh, for the SIU system when it comes to our work on anti-racism, diversity, equity, inclusion. We appreciate everything that you do. Um, thank you to the panel um, for your participation, both in your explaining the history, but also explaining your own history. I'm a big lover of first-person history, of hearing directly from the people who experienced it, and, and many of you have experienced some of these things, and I Appreciate you doing this. And this is obviously a good topic, focusing on uh, rethinking African-American history when we're in Black History Month, so a good time to do this. Um, I always think back when we talk about history to a history professor I had in college, and we were talking about, it was actually early women in, in sports in the 1800s and what was going on. And he says, you have to always remember that the people with power tell the stories, and you never get the full story unless you search a little bit harder for it. And so mostly we ended up hearing about the experiences of upper class black or upper class white women during that period of time. And it took more time to find out the stories of other people. And I've always reflected on that 
in, in everything. The, Europe, the world history I learned in elementary school was really European history. Um, the history I learned of the United States was not complete. And so finding out that complete history is something I focus on. And I teach class still, and I teach history in my class, and I'm always learning um, and always finding those additional sources. So I appreciate the opportunity to learn more. I always think the first step to making any change and why this is important is understanding how we got there. How do we get to where we are today? And you can't really understand that unless you do a very thorough and complete examination of history and all aspects of history. Um, sometimes it tells you things that you didn't realize. Certainly, I think Dr. Patterson talked about sometimes it dispels myths, things you thought were true or not actually true. Sometimes it enlightens things. Sometimes it opens up something else um, to help you make those changes going forward. Um, and actually, to, Dr. Staples talked about mapping out a plan for the future. And I think you can't do that unless you understand, again, how you got where you are today. Um, and actually, I think the other thing that occurred to me as I was listening to you all speak is that sometimes what we try to do is develop new ideas. But some people before us came up with some really great ideas. And Dr. Patterson talked about this as well. So what they were doing in the um, EHE program are things that really were good ideas that we still use today to some extent. We may modify some, but saying that history, we find out that people have already developed really good ideas. And I will say as a former Kent State education dean, it's very happy to see the Kent State tie uh, to SAUE I was not familiar with. So I, I learned something new about that as well. And it's actually interesting when I think about SIU history and SIU African-American history, there is a lot of positives. Um, you know, talking about even the number of faculty members we've had over the years, again, coming from an institution that had no black students until 1968, uh, the idea we had black faculty in the 1950s, uh, Catherine Dunham, here as an artist in residence, some really prominent people and, and prominent black students, um, you know, Dick Gregory, Charles Neblett, um, you know, Donald McHenry, uh, Reginald Petty, Eugene Redmond across our system. And, and yes, I've gotten to meet many of them. Um, Mr. Petty calls me on a regular basis. So I always say certain phone calls I get as president, I'm like, oh no, whenever I get a call from Mr. Petty, it always makes my life better. So I always like to see his number come up on my phone. Um, so anyway, so again, some really great people in our history as students, as faculty, and even the leadership, when you think about uh, while we still have work to do, we, again, Dr. Caldwell talked about things we've done recently, but I was always interested when I read the history, and that's actually one of the first things I did when I came to SIU was read the history, both of the Carbondale campus, the system, and, and the Edwardsville campus, um, that the number of prominent um, African-Americans in major roles, you know, including James Walker, who's been talked about several times, but even athletic directors, various vice chancellors, um, again, coming from an institution where I hired the first vice president, uh, first African-American vice president, the first African-American dean just in the last few years. Uh, the fact that this take took place well before I got here is things we should be proud of, but it doesn't mean that we're there yet. It doesn't mean that there aren't things we can still do. I, I liked what you said, uh, Father Brown, about the importance of continuity. Uh, we were, Dr. Caldwell and I were just talking about that, um, of looking at some of the efforts that places have made but they end up being very short-term efforts. And I think what she talked about as far as the mass of people we have together gives us a unique, unique opportunity, not only to do new things and, and really good things, but allowing that continuity. So even if one piece of that is gone, the fact that you still have the other 10 or 11 pieces makes a massive difference as opposed to putting it all on one person. So on one person, it doesn't usually last. And so I think that's, that's the real importance of that, that mass of people she mentioned. Um, and like I said, we, we have over the last two years been writing history in the next 10 to 15, which is I think my uh, career trajectory and how long I think I expect to be working. We hope to continue to write that history. And we're hoping that as we look back 10 or 15 years from now, we have a more positive history than we've even had in the past. And that we've actually made advances the way that we hope to relative to anti-racism, diversity, equity, inclusion. So I'll end with that and say thank you again to the panelists. Thank you to Dr. Caldwell. And thanks for everybody who joined us uh, for this conversation of understanding. Thank you. Thank you. This is very important. We are blessed. All of us are blessed. Dr. Caldwell. <laughs>